All right, here we go. So with the crypto market today itself, uh, Friday, for, what was it? 3.30 p.m., May 22nd. <clears throat> so I stated yesterday, uh, again, in the advantage side of the community, that we had been short um, from way back here, almost around May 12th or 13th. And we are finally in profit on our short, as you can see right there. Um, doing pretty well so far in our position. And here's kind of the way I'm looking at the, the market structure right now. We're headed into the weekend where it's kind of like a low liquidity environment. And I typically don't like how BTC looks in going into the weekend unless significant structures have been broken. Uh, and unfortunately in this present stage, it just doesn't seem like it. What we've really done is, you know, maybe this is like a wave five top right here. This is your A, your B, maybe your C, your D might come in some point, you know, maybe Saturday or something, your E, and then you might get a breakout to the upside. For this A, B, C, D, E pattern to be invalidated, you need this structural trend line right here to get broken. And that is around this area right here. So if we went straight down right now around $8,800, uh, if we went down to break it tomorrow, it'd be like 88.50, 88.75. But once that gets broken, okay, it'll be a very, very quick slide towards this lower uh, area of the range, around 84, 84.50. Um, even though I am a bear and I still have a bearish bias on Bitcoin, I have not ruled out or counted out the bulls for the last several days or even several weeks because they've been immensely strong and buying up every dip and every opportunity kind of like they have in the in the stock market which we'll discuss in a little bit and so um you know when we have uh when we have this kind of structure right here it is still consolidation i have not you know sort of broken out the, the whiskey or the champagne and celebrating my short just yet because i want to see more downside momentum and actual follow-through from the bears uh let's look at it from the the daily perspective here. Let me delete this thing. Um, pretty good volume on a daily perspective from this red candle to this one because higher volume, as you can see right there, as well as, you know, big old candle spread. So positive sign nonetheless. We still have about three and a half hours to go. Um, three and a half hours to go in this current daily candle. So we'll see, you know, kind of how it closes. As long as it closes, in my opinion, um, below this four-hour pivot right here, which again, pivots are just nothing more than you know support and resistance levels drawn out by this specific indicator. Um, as long as we close below that, I think we should still at least see another leg towards at least this key area, which is around 89.25. Um, let me see here. Uh, S1 is somewhere around 85.66, so we'll see um, if we can actually get towards that. But, you know, I still don't want to count out the bulls just yet. We really need to see follow through to the downside. Now, let me just check the stream and make sure everything is fine. Um, let's see here. Video stream quality it looks like ro low resolution. Uh, you could actually change the resolution on your end. Um, let me see here. I'm looking at it from my other uh, laptop and it looks all right. It doesn't look great, but it's not the worst. Um, let me see here. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, make sure you guys, you know, hit the thumbs up folks, just in case, uh, you know, um, you want to follow these streams and you want to keep watching them. You will get a notification. Also, if you hit subscribe, um, all right, so let's move on to the equity markets. We have Fassel here to discuss the equity side. Fassel, what's going on, man? Not much, man. How are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. It's been a very interesting day in the equity markets. Uh, one thing I do want to let our members know is, um, and people who are watching right now, we took on some uh, options trades over the last several days. Uh, we had this real, you know, fantastic trade, I think just last week, we closed up at about 360 or 400% average on the SPY put, I think just last week. Um, then we had another slightly you know, worse loss. Where was it? Not that one. 
uh, about 79% drawdown in our, in our put. And then today itself, um, I think we had another small loss at about 5%. So again, you know, the one thing that we try to implore in our community is um, trying to keep our winners big and our losers small. So, you know, I'll let Fassel take it away for the equity side. What do you got, man? Well, today, in terms of equities, it was a really interesting day because uh, I kind of came in with the assumption that we were going to see a really volatile day. And uh, if you took a look at the futures last night and this morning, it really kind of pointed to that. I think they were down uh, at least 1%. And so I was kind of feeling like, okay, I think uh, the market's going to end up going down and, and proving its direction finally. And then, of course, as the day played out, it ended up becoming just another flat day like we saw yesterday and the day before. And it really leaves a lot um, on Tuesday, once again. Uh, you're not going to see the market go up or down 100 points or 200 points or whatever. It's going to make a big move uh, to the upside or downside when it decides to move. Otherwise, it's just going to keep um, narrowing down and, and trading in these really flat days. But it's, it's incredible that even in a day that was relatively flat, you had stocks like Coop, um, yeah, which is a big software name, uh, a software leader, in my opinion, they made an all-time high. I believe there were a couple other stocks that made all-time highs that continue to, to push the envelope in terms of what investors are valuing in this day and age. So, is this the Coop software, Coopa? Let me let me check it out real quick. I have my charts open. Yes, Coopa software. That's it. And so, okay. um, they do a lot of you know connective software stuff. A lot of what what you've seen is in in fashion right now in terms of investing. These stocks have done arguably the best out of any sector in the market. And it looks like they're continuing to go up because there's some real long-term legs um, into this technological adoption that, that could end up playing out over the next five to 10 years. Like Facebook said, they're planning to have 50% of their workforce be remote within the next five to 10 years. And that's really impactful for, for these software stocks. And it makes them even more essential than they were before. So I was kind of on the, the edge as to why are these stocks going up so much? Like they're all trading, they're already trading at high valuations to begin with, um, you know, at the start of the month. And now they've just pushed it to an extreme. And it wasn't till, till today that I kind of realized, okay, people are really buying it for five to 10 years down the road because they see these as very essential infrastructure uh, so software names that, that will end up becoming the, bridges of business in general, business and employment in general. And so when looking at these stocks, you'll see a lot of them have crazy PEs and, and all this stuff. And um, I think this market has taught us to kind of ignore that and focus more on the growth rates for uh, at least we get, you know, one to two years down the line. I don't know if we get five year growth rates, but just to focus on that. And that seems to be how you can pick out the better winners and losers, uh, at least in this market. Yeah. And, and that's a great point that you mentioned about people maybe buying and picking up these stocks for the five, 10 year time horizons. And even though they are, you know, so um, overvalued at present moment, it, it just goes to show the, the resilience of, you know, the average investor um, who's looking at, especially sectors like tech, uh, you know, maybe AI or cloud. Uh, they're thinking that, all right, well, if I don't buy into things like JCPenney or, you know, Macy's or all these, you know, brick and mortar stores or even other industries that may not be doing so well, where can I put my money now where not only is it going to get yield even, you know, on, on the more smaller time frames like the next few weeks, the next few months, but it will do well overall over the next five to 10 years. Um, the one thing I think that kind of scares me is, I was looking at this data from Charles Schwab and E-Trade and Robinhood that there is now far more involvement from retail traders than there ever has been for the last several years. Because I think one, I mean, people are kind of just sitting at home and bored. And you know, one of the famous example is that there's this guy, Dave uh, Portnoy, he's this dude from Barstools. Um, let me see. Oh here. yeah. I like that dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <he's> funny. <laughs> so, you know, the funny thing is like, he was a guy who used to bet on sports, you know, like NBA and, um, uh, baseball and football, but now he's been so bored out of his mind that he had to go over to the stock realm 
um, to realize like, okay, well, you know, maybe this is kind of something similar. I can bet on companies. I could bet on CEOs and management and whatnot. And he's down, I think, $18 million on his account. It was like a screenshot that someone took in his live stream. And um, it just goes to show that like there's so many people who are never involved in the stock market, you know, now really want to get back in. Even some of my friends from college, you know, they're like, hey, should I start buying, you know, United Airlines or Delta or Caribbean Airlines because they're down so much? Or, you know, when a couple of weeks ago when we had that big uh, crash in oil, a lot of people started talking about uh, picking up oil ETFs. So do you worry about the overall, you know, very aggressively bullish sentiment of um, the average retailer thinking that, all right, you know, the market looks like it's just going to go up. We're just going to keep, you know, going along on it. That's a great question. And up until very recent, I want to say till yesterday, I really did get worried about how many people were telling me, you know, what should I buy? Like, I want to buy right now. What can I buy? Um, there was people, rich people, people who didn't have money. You know, I talked to a lot of people and everyone was just saying, when can I buy? No one was asking, should I sell now? Um, but the thing that changed my mind was when I saw and really studied how well the top 10 holdings of retail investors have done. And a lot of them, like I see why they are holding on to it because they haven't made any money in them. If you look at it, the airlines have been the number one sector that these retailers have been piling into. And they haven't done anything. And so what's the yeah. classic thing? People are just going to hold on and not sell because they really feel like they're getting it at that basement value. So for me, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of thinking to myself, okay, there's a lot of retail activity, but it seems to be only in a specific sector. So for now, I kind of want to stay away from the airlines or, or, you know, maybe even some of the oil plays. I don't know how, I don't think oil is in the top 10. I know Tesla was in a lot of the airlines and Boeing was in the top 10 holdings. But I kind of want to stay away from those trades because those are going to be the crowded trades and, and the ones that I think will not have that much success because so many people are betting on them. Yeah. Well, um, this week, I think you mentioned a couple stocks. Where was it? Uh, stock of the day or stock alerts? Um, um, for which one? Oh, yeah. Inf are you talking about Infi? Yeah, yeah. I think Infi. Yeah, Infi has done awesome. I think you guys, I think I talked about it in the video two weeks ago. I was really big on um, Infi because of the new uh, products that they put on uh, their data center products that really did some amazing things for data centers in terms of energy capacity and, and performance. And, uh, you know, I was really high. I've managed to get this stock on a, on a really rare pullback after its earnings jump. And I told people to buy it, I think, 104.20. It's at one. What's it at now? It's a, it was up good uh, today. Yeah. Uh, I think I saw it. I, I, I see uh, yeah. 118 you got it literally right on that dip you could have bought it i don't even know what moving average that was but hell you could have gotten it there and uh you know we've just rode that thing and i told people i was like i'm surprised this stock even though it's up so much for the year i'm surprised it's not up even more it's grown yeah. at a phenomenal rate and not only that the news that we got from nvidia regarding their data center business paints the picture in an even more you know, enticing way. And I think before the close, before we wrapped up our video yesterday, uh, I talked a little bit about this um, data center REIT, DLR. And I said it really looked interesting. And based off uh, the NVIDIA data, I was like, okay, data centers are still one of the fastest growing segments in the economy today. And so DLR today jumped up like 4%. So <laughs> it ended up being a really good day for REITs and, and especially for the stock centered around data centers. So um, those two picks continue to be, uh, I'm, I'm not in DLR. I try to get in today, but it just didn't come down to my price. Hopefully the market can sell off on Tuesday and, and I can get in. But, uh, those two stocks, because they're in the data center sector, um, I think you got to bet on them because that's that industry just looks so good in terms of growth and, and capacity. Yeah. And, and, uh, I just want to let our viewers know right now, uh, yesterday you did mention DLR in the live stream. And you've been talking about um, uh, Infi, as you said, the last couple of weeks. So on the Advantage side, for those of you who are watching, not part of the Advantage, make sure you come join, uh, hit the thumbs up or you know, go to our website, CryptoSomniac.com, hit the products page right there and join the Advantage membership because 
Fastle puts out these alerts as well as, you know, stock of the day every single day because he's, you know, a, a very, um, uh, very good at looking at the market and trying to figure out the diamonds in the rough, the hidden gems and present it to the community of, you know, potential, um, potential stocks that you can look at for the short term or the long term. And again, though we cannot provide investment advice, and he does his best to let people know exactly where you can you know, potentially get in in terms of entry points, maybe stops, maybe even uh, exit or targets. So make sure you hit the thumbs up. Make sure you uh, join the Advantage community. Uh, let's continue to um, let's continue to some of the other things that you're looking at in the market fast. So yesterday we spoke about housing as well. Any update on housing today? Man, housing continues to look like one of the best sectors right now in terms of uh, performance and value. It just, in my opinion, it has not gone up enough with where the industry is. Like I get the initial fear, the initial numbers when, when the shock came out was the housing industry just completely stopped in terms of demand and supply. Like no one wanted to sell and no one wanted to buy. Then it started to creep up a little bit faster than, than usual when Zillow the Zillow CEO kind of said we were seeing some really good activity uh, kind of, I think it was late March or something like that. And that was really surprising considering we were all still in, in a fear state. Uh, but then I also had a friend who was trying to find a house and she said um, she was, uh, you know, liking all these houses and then within a couple of days they were getting picked up and contracted like, and there wasn't even that much of a price drop. And so I started to see that and, and wonder, okay, maybe the housing industry is a little bit better than a 50% drop like the stocks indicated. Like, I mean, the sector ITB dropped literally 50%. It was one of the worst hit sectors. And yet the housing data that's coming out now is actually really good. So I think these stocks definitely have a little bit more juice to the upside. Um, I've talked about PHM, uh, DHI is another one I really like. Toll Brothers is good, uh, Lennar as some partnership with Amazon that seems to be interesting in, in three, four years down the line. Uh, so this space really is, is one to watch uh, as the housing data improves. Uh, I will say for this week upcoming though, I really liked where the healthcare sector closed. Uh, they've taken a beating for about a week and a half. A lot of these stocks in the medical device space, the pharmaceutical space. What's the, uh, the ETF for healthcare? XLV. That, that's just the broad general ETF. Um, IHI is for medical devices. And then I think I look at PJP for pharmaceuticals. Um, you can look, XLV is, is fine if you just want to make it simple. But uh, any of those sectors, even the insurers, the United Health and the CNCs, all of them kind of close similarly above their support levels. And usually when I see that happen, that's an indication that, okay, this sector is due for volatility. Now, I want to remind you, I was wrong, I want to say three weeks ago when I saw this same type of pattern in the financials, and they ended up literally breaking down the next week. And I was like, okay, I see, I see the signs that indicate volatility, but obviously I don't know which direction it's going to go, but I'm always willing to bet on volatility because that's just the type of trader I am. Um, so I got some calls in, in Bristol Myers. It's one of my, my favorite pharmaceutical stocks. Uh, they're growing exceptionally well this year and next year. Or I'm sorry, I, think, I don't think they're growing this year that much. I think next year, the growth rates are fantastic, like 30 40%. Um, I think they're still growing revenue this year, though. But either way, the stock, I think, is very undervalued. I think it's definitely like a $75 stock at least. Um, so I bought some calls in, in that stock, just three-week calls, just to play off that volatility. So like Which I one said, was that? Uh, BMY. Yeah, so you see it, it kind of hit the top end of its resistance, not necessarily the, the, where the all-time highs were before, but yeah. it hit its second level resistance, pulled back. It looks like it's holding on, and because of what I see in the entire sector, I'm willing to bet that, okay, the fundamentals look great, technicals are holding up. Now, if the volatility is right, that's exactly what I want to play. So I bought some cheap calls, and, and hopefully that can play out well within the next three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Um so nowadays, how do you see uh, the the vol like the volatility plays in in options? Because I know you're a big options guy. How have you seen the volatility, you know, in terms of affecting options up or down? 
Well, it's much better than, than it was a couple of weeks ago, a month ago when, when uh, the market dropped because the way options are priced, there's like a, there's like a formula. I forgot what a black Scholes formula. I think that's what it's called. Um, and basically what it is, is it gives you the components of what makes up an option price. Obviously the stock prices is, is a factor. Time is a factor and volatility is a factor. So when you have a very high spike in volatility, which we saw when the market drew down so much, um, it really prices in, you know, it adds so much premium into the options because now it's pricing in that same volatility to the upside that it kind of had to the downside. But as we know, and, and definitely as I know, as, as an options trader, there was so much more volatility to the downside than there is to the upside. So naturally, if you're going to buy, even at the lows, you are really even overpaying, even if you think the stock is going to have, you know, going to make a low from there and, and bounce up, it probably won't bounce up to the degree that the option price is pricing in. It's, it's really lucky. It'll be really lucky if it does, but it probably won't in my opinion. Uh, so right now the, the, uh, the health of the volatility is good. You can definitely buy options for months, two months, three months out and, and not pay too much premiums. Um, I would just say, just try and keep it. It is still relatively high. I would try to buy options. If you like to buy a month, two, three months out, buy options in the stocks that have reported like they reported a week ago. Um, because usually after an earnings or once the stock reports its earnings, the, the volatility drops because obviously people were betting on the premium, uh, yeah. for the volatility spike related to the earnings. And so once that premium is out of the stock, you can really get some good, um, cheap options. If you're looking down the line, you know, two, three months out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, really good point. Um, so looking two or three months out, probably you'll still get decent premiums in terms of uh, decent pricing on premiums for your options. And then looking out for options for companies that have already had their earnings. So I hope our viewers are actually paying attention to that because this is really good information from someone who actually trades options um, more frequently than a lot of people. Um, now, the I other do, thing I that I have to say, though, I, I just real quick, you know, you guys should really factor in your own thesis of the market in terms of how far you want to go in. Like, I don't, I, I don't normally, if you guys have seen my option calls, they're really short term time frames because I really don't like the market right now. It, it hasn't give, given too much direction. So I haven't been willing to buy options two to three months down the line because I really do think there's going to be a pullback within that time. And yeah. once there is, you know, those options are going to be tough to meet within that, that two to three months span, uh, probably, uh, unless yeah. you have a really great stock like a Microsoft or, or something that can bounce back even after that. Uh, but just keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, and again, th so Bristol Myers uh, Squibb, for those of you who are watching right now, here's a you know, free alert um, that Fassel put out to the Advantage community just today. And this is the kind of information that we put out on a daily basis. And we're really grateful, you know, for someone who actually looks at the market on a day-to-day -day basis, especially uh, in, in a complex instrument like options for Fassel to sort of give out this alert. Because last time I think you put on options alert, I think it yielded like a thousand percent or something. Yeah. Right? Which one was that? My Raytheon call. Um, it, it really did well. I saw the opportunity in, in terms of volatility and, I made about a thousand one hundred percent in in two or three days. I think so. Yeah. It was just you know it was I got lucky on on the rally that that happened Monday, but obviously the stock was in a great place. It rallied ten percent on Monday. Um, I would just the reason why I got into it was it was just way too oversold in my opinion, and I saw the the short term factors that allowed me to get into it. Uh, but yeah, I'm not perfect because those XLF calls that I did before, those have really run pretty much to zero. And it's been yeah. tough to kind of deal with that because I, I really like the financial sector and I bought it before when I saw the same volatility trade that I'm seeing now. But um, that's kind of how I mitigated the risk because I still wasn't willing to buy stock in JP Morgan or City or some of my favorite um, financial names, but I was more willing to play the volatility in terms of buying really cheap options. But unfortunately, they ended up completely collapsing. And unless there's a really good week, 
uh, coming up this week, then they're probably going to end up, you know, being worth nothing. So keep that in mind. Like there's a reason why I like to choose very cheap options because your cost to play that volatility is very low. And so that's the ultimate thing. You can use these as vehicles for um, if you are unsure about what's going to happen, but you still think there's going to be volatility in the near term, then I would use those options. So it's a, it's a hit or miss game. Like I'm, I'm very good in options, but there are some mistakes that I make like that, that XLF. I got to just say that. Yeah, no, I, th I mean, listen, I, I think admitting your, your mistakes or any traders mistakes is the one thing that makes us better, you know? Um, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah. Exa and, and you have to, right. Unless you actually accept where you are as a trader, you can never get better because if you don't fully accept your flaws and your faults, you'll keep making the same mistakes and pretty much bleed out your capital, you know, at some point. Um, you know, it's funny you say that because uh, I wanted to dial back to the, uh, the financials. Uh, see, I've actually been, um, obviously, you know, I've been more so of a bear in this entire run, which hasn't really cost me a whole lot, um, but it's kind of left me on the sidelines more often than not. So it's actually, you know, the, the plays that I've been making are more so high volatility plays and the S&P 500 hitting key resistance levels and me, you know, buying some uh, quick and cheap puts in the market. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I think I showed you guys a couple of weeks ago or just about a week ago, I think we made you know, some great plays at this particular put for May 18th, which was a 360% play. And then the following week after that, I had a drawdown of, uh, I think like 79% in the next option play that I had for a put. Now, the reason why I want to bring up financials is because the one thing that I've looked up uh, in terms of banking data, as well as, you know, XLF and, you know, financials in general, is I kind of have been looking at anecdotes of how uh, um, the banking sector did in 2008, 2009 financial crisis, as well as how the Eurozone did in 2004, 2005, when they went heavily into uh, their, you know, total QE program. And in both cases, financials and banks did actually, did, did not do so well. In that time, well, you know, in this particular time, what we're seeing is tech, uh, high growth, um, and and e you know even uh, some healthcare or biotech stocks are doing great, but financials and banks are still kind of just like sitting down there because I think there's possibly still uncertain about how things are going to get back uh, properly in the economy. Maybe they're factoring in credit delinquencies, um, maybe, you know, mortgage issues, maybe lending issues. And so the one play that I made, which is still going uh, well so far, actually is Wells Fargo. And I've been short on Wells Fargo since I think like maybe over here and over here. So it's been about, you know, maybe three or four days of or actually a good week of holding Wells Fargo as a short. And I still don't believe that banks like Wells Fargo or JP Morgan Chase are going to start breaking out anytime soon until we actually start resolving things in the economy until we start figuring out how to get the economy back up and running again and um, maybe even figuring out a vaccine so you know counter to your um, point about financials if we had put our heads together we would have both gotten financials right and we would have gotten <laughs> your your raytheon call right so net we'd just be you know in positive completely <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a thousand percent gain makes up for pretty much anything, everything that I lost on the, the XLF call. That's that's the key thing with options. It's all about how much you allocate to each trade. Uh, yeah, that's that is the key, in my opinion. It's not about putting putting all in one, even though it's cheap. It's just you put a little bit at a time, like for this BMY uh, position, I only have eight calls just to start off. And I think I, I want to keep it low to start off because Monday is a holiday and I still don't know if the premium will be. Uh, discounted even more on Tuesday or Wednesday. So my initial position is very small. I mean, it's, it's like around a hundred dollars. Um, yeah. So keep that in mind. Um, that's the key to being successful in options. It's all about capital allocation because you can get, like I said, you can get a thousand percent or your stuff can go to zero, but when you get that thousand percent, it covers everything. And so yeah. even if you can get two, 300%, like I think a lot of my option trades do, um, it'll end up becoming a lot better. So just keep an eye on capital allocation and, and how you put money to use in the options market because it's just, it's very volatile. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think uh, options plays, you know, even for myself, uh, I think what I like to do 
is when I know that I'm fairly confident about a key resistance level. And again, you know, the market could obviously do anything that it wants to, but in this particular play right here, this kind of, you know, your technical double top, this is where I started to increase my position into the option that I took a couple of weeks ago um, because I was fairly confident that, okay, well, this is a resistance level. If we smash up through it, I'll close it, you know, but I yeah. kept adding onto my position, like, you know, hundred here, 500 here, a thousand here. And then once I started seeing more progress to the downside, then I added even heavily. Um, now, what I want to ask you is, you know, when it comes to sizing, right, is there, because a lot of, you know, traders or members of ours, uh, something that they deal with often is, I think they enter too heavily in the wrong trade and then in the right trade, they size down too much. How do you gauge as like a formula of, you know, like how much do you want to size size in with a trade or do you have just like a specific you know amount of okay i'm always going to go in with x percent uh, x percent of my portfolio into this trade yeah that's a great question um in terms of options i kind of have a, pos a starting position and then i usually if it stays within my um technical contention i'll even buy more even if the price gets cut in by 33 percent or 50 percent even um i have that much confidence in my technicals and usually ends up working out uh but uh there's not really um a certain amount that i'm i'm trying to allocate to that in terms of stock uh i do like to to buy you buy half your position at your initial target and then you kind of wait till the end of the day to see how it closed out then you buy a little bit more and then you wait till I want to say two or three days later to see how the stock's trading up. And then you finally complete your position. Um, it's all about not doing everything at once. In my opinion, that's, that's what I've learned. Uh, it, it really helps to, to break things down as, as a way to mitigate risk. Yeah. Uh, and obviously risk mitigation, especially in, in, you know, financial markets is the number one key because you know, uh, I've always talked about how the, the first rule in trading is obviously uh, kind of like fight club is, um, you know, risk, risk as little of your capital as possible when you're uncertain about a trade. Okay. So capital preservation obviously is the number one rule. Okay. Number two is then being able to grow your capital. So unless you actually can follow rule number one, which is, you know, being able to manage your risk, being able to preserve your capital, you can never get to that rule number two, you know? And mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of members in our community, they come kind of, you know, hobbled from other places or, you know, trying to test out the markets on their own and say that, well, you know, I thought I was a good trader, but then eventually I realized like the market kind of, you know, bled me out and rode me down to zero. A um, couple of the reasons why is because they're unable to cut their, um, cut their losses short. So do you have any, I guess, piece of, piece of advice to give to people when it comes to seeing a losing position, um, when it comes to a losing position in their trade? Like, how do you cope with that? Oh yeah, well, to start off, I've had so many times where I've bought something and it's just like not done what I thought it would do at that price, even though I was so confident going in. Um, you have to, you, it's not about, like whether or not a stock closes above a certain price, I like to deal with things in ranges. Um, so if I have a support or resistance level, I usually like to say, okay, if I don't want it to break above like 185, I definitely, if it starts closing above, or I'm sorry, it starts closing below like 184, 80, 70, 60, and it really kind of confirms that it's breaking away from that initial point, then I'm gonna make this, the decision to say, okay, that's when I'm gonna cut my losses. But it's all about sticking to discipline and, and finding out a strategy that really works for the timeline of your trades. Um, I like to be a little bit more precise, so my my areas are are pretty tight. Um, but you know, if you're a long-term investor, you can you can find ways to mitigate risk just by using you know either a moving average or a couple moving averages, high and low ranges. Um, there are multiple ways. You just gotta understand what type of trade you're in and what you're kind of looking to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually I, I, I did a trading strategies tip for people a couple of weeks ago and I just told them that one of the simple 
rule of you know bullish and bearish uh, flips on moving averages are I use a 20 EMA and the 40 EMA in tangent um, together and I show people how any time frame you can use this on any time frame and you could use this simple trading strategy as the bullish crosses are you know the lower moving average above the higher moving average so 20 above the 40 so green above the red and you can see that when this made its bullish cross right here so right around this point okay this was your area to potentially go long okay mm -hmm. and you don't flip short technically till over here when it made that cross, when it made that flip, right? Or even over here, actually, it made a small flip of the moving average, right? So it's a quick and easy strategy. Like from here to here, you make 1.3%, okay? Or if, again, you got out of here and you re-entered right here, right? Again, there's your bullish flip uh, and then your bearish flip right there, 0.65%. Just a just an easy strategy that, you know, we, we laid out for our... Um, advantage members because it's very hard for everyone to look at the market in the same way you and I do of understanding, you know, what's happening behind the fundamentals, what's happening behind the technicals of, you know, ranges or trend lines or overbought or oversold levels. And I think identifying these simple uh, ways of looking at, you know, bullish or bearish flips in terms of just simple moving averages, of course, you got to understand what's happening in the overall trend. Uh, I think that these are the things that I really hope to show our uh, members on a day-to-day -day basis because that's ultimately what's useful in this market is when you can do things on your own and you could start at least not losing money or you could start making some money, you know? So I think that's one thing that we do really well in our community. And I'm glad um, we have someone like you to, to explain what you see in the market on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah. So to, to, to wrap this up, you know, I wanted to give the members something to take away for the, for the weekend and for the week ahead. So going into the weekend, you know, like I think you had said that sometimes, you know, on Saturdays or Sundays, you'll do some research here and there on companies or you'll write out your newsletter. What are things that you're looking forward to the week ahead uh, in terms of markets and any tip that you can give uh, in terms of a stock that you're looking out for, you know, let's just say Tuesday market open? Um, yeah, sure. Um, just real quick, I want to touch on just, I guess it's different within when you're looking at stocks versus crypto, but there's a lot of emphasis in my technicals that, that are backed by fundamental research. Like I will never get into a stock that I don't like the fundamentals on. That is at the core of believing whether or not my support or resistance levels will end up holding or, or whatever. Um, I just wanted to make that clear. Like if I put out an alert, it is usually because I really agree with the fact that the fundamentals should support the overall movement that I'm betting on. And even more so that the support levels that I'm anticipating uh, it to hold, that's where I expect there to be buyers because there is fundamental value in the stock and it should be trading at a higher level. Um, I just wanted to, to give you guys that take. I think it's different than on crypto because there's not really much um, fundamentally driven momentum per se. I oh yeah. What, what, you're, you're totally right. I mean, what, I just wanted to expand upon that. And I really credit your, your research that you do before you put on alert, because it's not just, you know, Hey, I'm, you know, uh, buying this stock here and selling it here. You go through an in-depth analysis of a company and you lay out, you know, a multitude of reasons why you're thinking about picking up the stock or why you're thinking about shorting it or longing it or whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that just goes to show the, the amount of research and time you put into each position. And, you know, to be honest, you, you're absolutely right. There's literally zero information when it comes to crypto about uh, why, you know, something is fundamentally moving. It's, to be honest, it's a lot of hocus pocus, right? Like, there's <laughs> not a whole lot of going on in the crypto markets, especially in altcoins, which are anything other than Bitcoin. There's even less so. It's actually become such a Ponzi scheme in terms of altcoins because uh, there are so many bigger players or algos that are driving the market up and down just based on, you know, some of the more uh, supply and demand uh, based indicators that they have. You can literally see. So, for example, one of our members asked about uh, this stock right here or this crypto right here, Omise Go. It's I think it's like a 
um, what is oh. it, a Thai or a Malaysian company. And, you know, again, for the last like several years, I mean, it hasn't done anything, Damn. literally, <laughs> literally nothing, you know? And so it's been in a drawdown mode for like two or three years. And I think what happens often is when people see, you know, big green candles like this, they start buying over here. But in reality, what they don't realize is, holy crap, we're down almost still, even if you took it from this high right here, you're still down 94%, right? <laughs> so if you buy here, you're, you're effectively buying the top. I mean, because you don't really know if this thing is going to keep trending up. All you did see is this, you know, one big, large green candle. And this is why I've been telling people in the crypto community, if you really want to preserve your capital or you want to grow your discipline as a trader, stay away from altcoins like this because this is just garbage. Like these companies are supposed to go to zero at some point. What you're really doing is you're hoping on the intraday movements here and there to make yourself, you know, 10, 50, hundred percent. And for the most part, it's not really going to happen because unless you bought somewhere near the bottom, you're effectively buying the top. And so there's no technical reasoning why things are actually going up, which is going up because there's, you know, some, some bots out there who are just clearing up um, whether it's, you know, short liquidations or whether they're going through, you know, just a exodus of lack of demand and they see the market is easier, you know, in terms of the order book on the way up. There's literally no reasoning for why these uh, quote unquote companies are going up. So this is why I want people to be very careful of when they invest into these altcoins, because to me, they're pretty much worthless. So, like they actually should be worth zero. The only thing that should actually be worth something is probably Bitcoin and Ethereum, maybe a few other companies that I don't really know of. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right when it comes to technical versus fundamentals, because the only thing that we look forward to, and you've seen my analysis before, all I discuss is technicals in our crypto analysis, because mm -hmm. there's nothing more to discuss. The only large yeah. event that we had in crypto is the having event, which is a supply depletion event where you know, the having it's, it's like, so say for example, you know, if someone went into a gold mine, you know, every single week or every single year and they found 10 ounces of gold and then somehow some entity out there just said that, Hey, from now on every cave, every mining facility that you go into, you will only find half the amount of gold that you were able to mine. It's a very unique feature, deflationary feature of Bitcoin. And that's why I love Bitcoin. Um, but that's the only event that really matters, which is, you know, that huge supply cut. Aside from that, it's all technical. It's all like, you know, SR levels or, you know, uh, overbought and oversold levels. So uh, with the long drawn out point, what I'm trying to say is, you know, I really admire your time and dedication that you have to doing your research about specific companies because uh, it is really admirable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I, um, I did. I'd have a small question about it because I don't keep up with Bitcoin that much. But when the hat, the the cutting of the supply happened, what happened to the price? Does that mean the price automatically jumps up by double because you cut the supply, or how was that news? Or was that news like priced in beforehand, like it would be kind of a stock? I mean, I think the news was definitely priced in because here's when the uh, actual supply cut happened. Or was it? Um, I think it was like on maybe this day. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think someone, whoever is watching this video right now, I think it was around this day or this day is when um, the supply cut happened. Okay. So yes, you know, we hit this high around 10,085, uh, just about maybe four or five days before and then we never reached up towards that high and we started rolling back over. And obviously prior to that, you know, we've had big run-ups towards that, uh, towards that, uh, uh, what's it called? Bitcoin having event. But, you know, the thing is just like Bitcoin ran up this much, so did the stock market, you know? So it's like very interesting that it just so happened to be that the stock market as well as Bitcoin's having event, you know, pretty much came right at the top. I just found that really, really interesting. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's interesting because like what you've seen with all the high growth stocks, a lot of these, you know, the big reason they've gone up so much is because they're going to be part of the next wave of infrastructure and technology. So it's really interesting to kind of see Bitcoin follow in that same uptrend. Obviously, it hasn't broken out, but at least I think there may be some of that same momentum that carry those software stocks. Um, it may be also in a Bitcoin, too, because both of them are 
high risk assets, but but both of them are following the theme of they could be game changing technologies um, within the next five to ten years. You know. Yeah, exactly, and and I think you know blockchain will definitely have its place in society, and I think it's gonna I think it's gonna do some amazing things in the next you know five years, um, but. You know, I think Bitcoin and, and many of these assets still have a lot to prove um, mm -hmm. when it comes to adoption, like real, you know, adoption of actual usage and utility. And it just doesn't seem to be the case right now. This is why I kind of went back to the drawing board. And I did this big analysis of how I still see Bitcoin to, you know, want to drop some more, um, maybe back towards like a thousand or two thousand dollars. Um, and here's some of the reasoning why. So I'll give people like a brief synopsis of what I was looking at. Uh, grab, look up this thing right here. So I drew this uh, big, you know, pitchfork. And this is like a shift pitchfork, which is a big sort of a technical, you know, uh, trending uh, overlay. And the one thing that I noticed is, you know, if you look at this level right here, 10,584, right? We hit that level around October 2019. And, and you know, I, I want you to comment on this too after. Uh, we hit this level in October 2019, then we came back to it again in February, fell, I think about $30, $40 short, sold off aggressively, went all the way down to like 3,600. Now we're coming back towards that same level again. Again, not able to even get towards that level uh, and not even close to smashing through it. So my proposition is, I think Bitcoin is probably going to have to go down lower and maybe look lower for liquidity, spend some time down here, maybe start building out its tech, actually figuring out, hey, is Bitcoin something that is actually going to be you know, widely adopted or is this just a failed experiment? And at least for that to happen, I think price needs to come down here further, maybe $2,000, maybe $1,000, and maybe start its climb back up in the next year or two. So when you look at something like this on a technical time frame, how do you look at this aside from just, you know, ignoring the fundamentals? Um, just on a technical basis. Yeah, I could definitely see there's a resistance right here that it's dealing with, even though it's not at that black line, it's kind of in that same resistance range. Um, so it's, it's no surprise why it hasn't kind of gotten up to that specific point, but I think it's a, it's going to be a prove it week, maybe one or two weeks for this doc, for this, uh, the uh, asset, if it starts to make a lower low on a weekly basis uh, next week or even the week after, I think, yeah, uh, you could probably see this asset pull back. I don't know the degree that it would pull back though, because at the same time, it's kind of gone up with the stock market, correct? Well, you know, technically it bottomed out before the stock market and it actually started climbing before the stock market did. So uh -huh. in, a, in a way, I think I've told you this before, sometimes Bitcoin due to its you know, high risk uh, um, nature or its low liquidity nature, I think it actually leads the market sometimes. Just like I told you, right around February, Bitcoin actually started selling off maybe about five days before the stock market. Mm -hmm. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah, so I, I'm just wondering how that dynamic plays into it because if the market ends up continuing to go upwards, I wonder if that momentum carries over into Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's very possible. I think if equities are actually going to start breaking out above its, you know, three thousand level or something, mm -hmm. um, I would probably figure Bitcoin goes up a little bit higher. But you know, I, I still think that this area is a tough area to deal with, and I don't quite know if we're ready to break through it just yet. Especially because, you know, I'm still a, I'm still a bear on the stock market. I still think that we're we're probably going to have at least another leg down. I don't know what's going to trigger it off, whether it's this whole China news event or whether it's just, you know, hey, we've made you know eight straight weeks of upside movement, no real pullback. I mean, maybe we need a retracement back down. Or I don't know what it's going to be, but that's what I'm thinking. You know, that's the one way I could see equities pulling back, Bitcoin pulling back as well. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, well, um, I'm going to wrap up this session here, Fassel. Thank you so much for joining us, man. I appreciate your insight. Um, for those of you who are watching this stream. I think you cut out at the end. 
watching, please hit the thumbs up. Uh, make sure you subscribe and go to Vantage membership where you can get Fassel's stock of the day, stock alerts, and you can be uh, shorting Bitcoin with us instead of being long and being in a losing position. All right. <laughs> Hope you guys have a good rest of your, rest of your weekend. Um, happy Friday and happy Memorial Day for those of you guys who are in the U.S. All right. Take care. Cheers. And again, hit the thumbs up.